Today I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker and the very last Hyde Lecture speaker, last but not least, Arana, uh, Rana Abudei. Rana is an assistant professor and the Robin Keller Avi Avia Professor of Interior Architecture at the University of Tennessee College of Architecture and Design. She earned her Bachelor in of Arts in Architecture and Master's in Architecture degrees from the University of New Mexico. Her work is invested in amplifying design as a mechanism of placemaking and social transformation. It transverses diverse intellectual personalities and geographic locations, gouging trajectories situated at the intersection of advanced digital making, representation, and social justice. Abude is a licensed architect in her native country, Jordan, where she's researching interiority and displacement in the context of refugee settings. She joined the faculty at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville in 2015. Previously, she taught at the University of New Mexico and worked at Antoine Predoc, architect on numerous projects, including the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. Abude is a recipient of several awards and grants, which include the IDEC 2021 Special Projects Grant, the IDEC 2022 Teaching Excellence Award, and the Patrick Lawson Faculty Award, the Dundley Scholar Award, and being named one of Design Intelligence 2019 Most Admired Interior Design Educators. Her work has been published in several academic journals, including Interiors Journal, the Journal of Interventions and Adaptive Reuse, and the Idea Journal. Her work has also um, published through ACES and book chapters, the most recent of which are Pop-Up Cities, Refugee Camps Be Between Transience and Resilience, in Gregory Marinick and Pablo Mininato's Informality and the City. She has also published in the, On the Move, a polysemy on contextual dynamism and creative expression in Brian Kentley and Peter Baldwin's speculative coldness. Oh, speculative coolness, sorry about that. All right, I have one little housekeeping item. Please, we'll have a microphone for you, the audience, to ask questions at the end of Rana's talk. So make sure that you're taking notes, and if you have any questions, just raise your hand up, I'll come running to you and I'll give you the microphone and you can ask the question. All right, so without further delay, please join me in welcoming Rana Abude to the stage. Thank you, Aziz. Thank you so much. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to reset the time so I don't go over. All right, so uh, hello all. Thank you, Aziza, for the gracious introduction. And thank you for the lectures committee and the college for hosting me. It is truly an honor to be with you this afternoon and to get a chance to share my work with you. Um, I mean, I, and I've been, I spend the whole day in the morning meeting students and seeing work, and I'm super impressed by what you guys have going. I think it's a great, strong program and a testament to a great body of faculty with very interesting work. So thank you all again for hosting me. Um, my lecture is titled, Becoming Dynamic, Design in the Age of Multivalence. Uh, allow me uh, to briefly discuss the, uh, this title with you. So in their book, A Thousand Plateaus, Deleuze and Guattari used the, used the word becoming extensively, employing it in reference to a process of change, flight or movement, within an assemblage. As Deleuze and Guattari explain, the process of becoming is not one of imitation or analogy, um, it is, uh, it is generative of new ways of being that are a function of influences rather than resemblances. Becoming removes elements from their original functions and brings about new ones. Situated within this understanding, becoming dynamic presents spatial frameworks that examine ro the role of design in today's shifting realities and its aptitude for generating and supporting new forms of belonging. We are all products of influences, places, people, policies that shape us. And we can say that we are too in a process of becoming. That also applies to what we conceive as designers. I am the product of many influences, places, conditions that shaped me. 
this is a walk through the streets of Old, Old Town Amman, the capital of Jordan, uh, where, where I'm from. Uh, these alleys and streets played an integral role in shaping my spatial thinking. These are fluid, fluid places where the distinction between interior and exterior disappears. Such spaces precariously carry the code of the city, its smells and sounds, and the hidden narratives of its dwellers. These dynamic places are always in states of becoming. They don't subscribe to one function, one program, one identity, but multiplicities, where one space assumes multivalent states and implications. While it has been years since I have been physically there, since 2015 to be precise, uh, the impact of uh, these places still surface in my work and uh, my thinking today. And just as I, shaped, I was shaped by many places, I also helped shape some, uh, some places in, some in my capacity as a designer. One of the projects that I was fortunate enough to work on during my time at Antoine Prudac Architect was the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. What was incredible about working on this project is of course what it stood for, but to me it also demarked a vivid moment of becoming. Becoming aware of architecture, um, architecture's influence as a dynamic force that shapes the human experience and underwrites its narratives. I'm showing those two clips to reflect on the lecture's topic, yes, uh, but also to set up the premise of my work that lies within the multivalent context these places frame. I organize my work in a number of themes that fold into each other and ultimately inform my teaching. I will cover some of those themes this afternoon and work my way back to teaching. And if I run out of time, I'll have to skip parts, so just bear with me. Um, the first theme uh, is interiority and displacement. What you are seeing on the screen now are aerial views of Al Zaatari refugee camp in Jordan, showing its growth in a matter of months from a small settlement to the largest Syrian refugee count, uh, camp in the region and the fourth largest city in Jordan. The theme of interiority and displacement addresses the, policies, the politics of place and more so the politics of multi-place. The research examines displacement and forced migration in the Middle East, highlighting the role of interiority in settings of instability. The study is multi-scalar. It ranges from surveying the overall planning, logistics, and growth patterns of several camps to understanding shelter clusters and the singular unit within them. In its totality, the work postulates that the production of space and territory in refugee camps offers agile development patterns applicable to placemaking anywhere. In the book After Belonging, Keller Esterling calls for the rethinking of refugees as rejected populations. Instead, she indicates that the passage of a refugee and their, um, and the, but the passage of a refugee and their endurance is a special credential that should capture the global imagination as a story about being released from the conflicting logics of sovereignty. She states, a refugee story is not about those who belong nowhere, rather it is about those who belong everywhere. My own research about refugee camps arrives at similar conclusions, showcasing camps as resilient cities and speculating on the role of design as a platform for empowerment rather than for, provi for provision. Refugee camps offer, um, often unfold amidst regional endemic migrations, limited resources, and ongoing political and env environmental and economic challenges. They subsist, through, they subsist through robust social structures that transcend geographic location, rendering them dynamic landscapes between transience and resilience. So why study refugee camps in Jordan? I mean, first I'm Jordanian, so that's speaking the language helps. And uh, I am also, a uh, my, my family on my mother's side is um, descendants of Palestinian refugees. So I have that kind of personal connection to the work. Uh, but also Jordan um, offers a really fertile ground to study displacement. Um, so uh, jo Jordan um, is a small kingdom, if you don't know, it's a small kingdom in the heart of the Middle East with very few natural resources, no oil, no money, you know, just very limited resources and a severe scarcity of water. Uh, about 11% of total population in Jordan are refugees and this number does not take into account 2 million, 2 million Palestinian refugees and their descendants that were granted citizenship in 1954 Factoring that number, not number in raises that percentage to 18%, making Jordan the country with the most number of refugees relative to population in the world. And population grows, uh, growth in camps is often exponential. And while it fluctuates at times, it sustains continual increase. 
in, in this slide are the three camps in Jordan that my research focuses on. Those are the ones marked in red, uh, in comparison to other camps in nearby countries. Once a refugee camps get established, rarely does it cease, as many displaced individuals never return to their countries of origins and must live in an ongoing condition of statelessness. Camps often get a bad rap. Misconceptions that paint refugees as a drain on the system are not only inaccurate, but extremely dangerous. Refugees, despite the hardships, the discrimination and scarcity they endure every single day, are resilient individuals and resourceful societies that have so much to offer the local and global communities. This slide shows the three camps that I'm studying in white um, and the cities nearby in yellow. In all three cases, the existence of the camp actually helped bolster the city and the villages um, economically and socially um, in many ways. Uh, and refugee camps are complex entities that are at the intersection of a triad of authority, composed of the UNHCR, which refers to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the host country, and the vast number of NGOs. In this diagram, I trace the NGOs and the authorities that operate and manage one of the camps I'm studying and link those to the services they provide. I just wanted to, again, give you an idea of what goes into the management. So what you're seeing, what's highlighted on red, um, in the list um, are the Jordanian governmental entities, the gray are the UN governmental entities, and the others are actually NGOs from countries from all over the world. So the, the, the politics of this matrix are inherently complex. For instance, land on which the camp sits, it sits on is leased by the UN from the private landowners or allot allotted by the host uh, government. The host country often provides policing and, um, and security. And sustaining the camp's daily function depends largely on NGOs that stem from various countries, as again you can see in this diagram. Uh, to be more precise about the camps I'm studying, sorry the text is not coming out too, too, uh, too clearly, but from the top going down, the first one I'm looking at is al Baqa Camp City, which opened in 1967 and is home to 119,000 registered Palestinian refugees. And the type, and I, I try to put those camps in typologies. So I, I said, I'm, I'm calling this uh, type of camp a protracted displacement camp city. And I'll elaborate on that in a second. The second one down is Al Zatar refugee camp, which opened in July 2012 and at its peak housed 150,000 Syrian refugees and be becoming the fourth largest city in Jordan. And that type of um, camp is emergency encampment or makeshift city. And the last one is Al-Azraq refugee camp, which opened in April 2014 and home to 35,000 Syrian refugees. And this camp is an example of a pre-planned pre refugee community. And I'm just trying to highlight sort of again the difference in the, the fabric of each of those camps. Um, th this diagram shows the evolution of refugee camps from the singular shelter unit to a dense urban cluster. And you can better see where each of those camps lies. So the way, the way camps work, I mean, they start, obviously, there is a, there's an event that happens. A, a group of, um, large group of population gets displaced. So they go to host to nearby countries. They get, um, they get provided with tents. So tents are the first way of shelter, right? Then after that, they get provided with what I call the proto-modular shelter, which is either prefabricated or just a simple shelter unit. That's a step above the tent, I guess. And in time, what happens is the refugees start to move and shift those, um, those shelters to create their own clusters that actually start to support their own familial structure. And as time go by, you can start to see things um, like, uh, see, like they augment the, the proto um, shelter with things like CMU, concrete, where, so it starts to take a more permanent presence until it becomes a full on um, urban cluster like you see in the farther end of the slide. So the, the, the al Baqa camp, which is the Palestinian refugee camp, is already on the upper hand here, and it's a full-blown urban cluster, uh, very well-established and robust refugee camp, versus the other Syrian one, just by the time they were established, are still somewhere in this diagram. So this photo here gives you a sense of the fabric of al Zatari and where it sits relative to the evolution of the, the diagram I showed you. So you can already see here some of the modular shifting, uh, other materials being brought in to argument and to support kind of familiar structures and a long-term type of living. 
So before proposing design strategies and intervention in al zatari I was trying to understand the process of displacement in, in its many iterations. So given that, again, Jordan has uh, Palestinian and Syrian and Iraqi refugees, I wanted to, to com like compare the uh, compare, I compared the Palestinian diaspora of 1948 to the more recent Syrian one uh, that started in 2012. And outside of the politics, two key differences uh, existed between the two that made a huge difference in the camp's development patterns. Um, and let me just say this off the bat, the Syrian refugee narrative in Jordan is faring much better than the Palestinian one. They're, they're, the Syrian refugees are, I mean, despite there's a lot of issues still, but they're just faring better and they're able to establish makeshift cities, start economies, and just become more self-dependent. Uh, so I tried to like figure out, I mean, what made the difference? And again, like I said, apart from the politics, two things emerged in terms of design, which is the prefabricated flat packed shelter. And one of the most recent one is the IKEA shelter. And it's a really beautiful, actually well-designed flat pack shelter and portable technology. So what the flat pack shelter um, allowed is it made it faster to accom accommodate the, the refugees and transition them from tents to caravan units. But more importantly, it offered them a kit of parts that could be modified and, tra and traded more easily. The other aspect that is portable technology exemplified by the cell phone. So having access to portable technology allowed, allowed Syrian refugees to carry at least fragments of their memories and identities with them. Uh, and also cell phone became means of documenting their struggles and disseminating their accounts, uh, harnessing global awareness and accountability, an advantage that Palestinian refugees didn't have, uh, didn't have access to. Um, also, the diff other differences that emerged between the two, um, the two types of camps is where they were located. So the Palestinian camps got established near a big, bigger city, while the Al-Zatari camp was established in the desert near a small village of Al-Zatari. Um, so, and you could see part in, in this, you could see part of the village in the upper corner of that slide. Uh, so, so what that, um, what this allowed to do is, um, it, for, Locating al zatari in the desert kept the Syrian refugees out of the mind of the side of the Jordanian populace who are already struggling with economic scarcity. So, that, I mean, the, it made it, the, the easy scapegoat, the refugees an easy scapegoat. So every time the country goes to struggle, it's the refugees' fault. But this kind of helped kind of elevate that in a sense. But it also t uh, tied the prosperity of the al zatari with the village. You know, it be, they became two tied um, entities. So the, the refugee population and the host community became sort of tied together in their prosperity and advancement. Um, so um, in that sense, I mean, I think the siding mattered a lot. Uh, versus the one that was located, uh, the Palestinian camp, which was located near the capital, uh, always like kind of remained restricted and it had only a chance to go vertically uh, because it was also the city kind of grew around it, basically, the capital. So within these realities and in terms of design, I started to ask what could be deployed within such sites preemptively to accommodate the, estab uh, the establishment of various configurations for living that can fluctuate and change. So I didn't want to really rethink the shelter unit, but I proposed just a structural system that would allow clusters to occur and grow. Uh, these strategies mitigate the harsh climate and barren nature of the desert, introducing shade pockets and exterior gathering spaces while facilitating future development of water infrastructure and plumbing. So the series of three are just like speculative ideas in terms of how the pre, uh, prefabricated shelter could plug in into a, into, um, a structural system. The following three slides illustrate the deployment of those ideas in rural camps like al Zatari, accounting for the permanent temporality of the camp. The photos on the left are from al Zatari camp showing the current fabric of the camp and the need for proper plumbing systems. So what you're seeing in this lower slide are actually plumbing trenches that are dug by refugees. So it's open plumbing, which is highly problematic because I mean, you could see the children playing right there and there has been many misfortunate accidents. Uh, so the idea of deploying a structure allows the refugees to really start to control how the, the camp grows, but it also elevates it from the ground plane, allowing for future development of things like plumbing and placing of infra infrastructure take place. Uh, another thing it, it provides is actually shade, you know, because in the desert, like, run, like you, you don't have access to shade. So the fact that you go vertically allows for those public spaces to happen underneath and still while allowing the refugees to bring their own language in terms of the construction and the establishment of those units. 
Um, so uh, as I envisioned it, those, those clusters would change over time. They would get draped, they would get supplemented, and they would get modified as needed. And those are just a few visualization of how this could eventually be t entirely taken over by a system that's entirely um, designed by the refugees based on their needs and um, lifestyles. So the idea of deploying a structural system, of course, is not new. Le Corbusier's Domino House was designed as a prototype for a physical platform for mass-produced housing. So the same logic is, is at work here, but that is where the role of the architect, designer, planner ceases, allowing the refugees to configure, cluster, and drape, and modify the living units as needed. Leaning on traditions learned from vernacular constructs like the Bedouin tent seen in the upper left-hand corner. So similar concept could be deployed in urban camps like al uh, seen here in this photo, but I'll be intervening in this camp is more tricky logistically and politically. Um, uh, so uh, like the, the, I mean, this is, uh, the camp, al camp is highly policed. So it's a very kind of difficult even space to intervene in. It lacks any sort of communal spaces. So it's a very, like intervening here becomes like a whole different, um, ball game in a sense. Uh, so in order to think of how that growth could happen, I mean, obviously growing vertically is one, the, the, one, one of, I mean, the only way to kind of grow. So I'm, I'm saying in camps where protracted displacement occurs, intervention takes on a different nature, governed by existing densities and adjacencies. Growth can only happen vertically, where pockets of space can be found in the dense um, built, um, in the dense built fabric. To better explore this, I tried to model and code a cluster in the camp and find areas for seeding formal interventions that can function as multi-purpose community spaces as seen in the upper left-hand corner. So what, what I was able to do, and again, I was talking to Aziza about what, what I'm using, I'm teaching myself this new uh, procedural modeling program called Houdini, and I was able actually to code the existing cluster, and all those num are actually numbers that you can weigh by population density, so it kind of calculates sort of like vacancies where a structure could grow or increase. So I just tried to bring that language into um, the intervention that would be proposed. Uh, so the idea, oh, sorry, let's go one. So the idea that the intervention would be in those bulbous shapes that you're seeing here growing upward, but structurally this will rise on, uh, the intervention would rely on existing construction practices that leave rebars extended and exposed in anticipation of future growth and expansion. Um, if you, I think this is also popular in South America and the Middle East, when you build, you, ne you, you always leave the rebars exposed and that was, that's a way to kind of anticipate future growth. So literally a new addition and an expanding family will just keep on adding on that construction. So it's a similar idea that's employed into the growth here. So this image sh shows conceptually the vertical extension of the structure that would, when, that would enable the cluster to grow and the growth results in intricate spaces and urban rooms. Such intervention act challenge the limitations set on refugees in camps that are, often, uh, that are often excluded from rights and services enjoyed by citizens, allow them to build and expand with minimal engagement with the ground surface that, as you may recall, is leased by the UN from the local communities. Uh, the construction of such expansion is informed by local construction practices using adobe and earth-backed construction. Uh, these building practices are sustainable and can respond eff effectively to the local climate and fluctuating daily and seasonal temperature. More importantly, these construction methods have always been community-based events, a catalyst for rooting uh, collective identities, both liter literally and figuratively. So again, those are like local construction methods that I'm, tr I'm just trying to represent um, in, in sort of the digital format. Uh, so this is a section through the cluster, and I'm thinking, what could it be used for? I mean, um, the, the idea, like, food is dispensed to refugees by NGOs. So how could we make, how could refugees become more dependent? So the idea of introducing or employing those, those expansions as, um, uh, like, they're called dove cots or, um, uh, what are they? that's the other word, sorry, I forgot the word. Like, so they're pigeon coops or dovecots that would house the uh, house population of pigeons. And pigeons are recreational, but they're mostly edible too. So that would also kind of create and support a little bit of food independence, independence upon 
uh, among the refugees. And actually, this is not uncommon in Middle Eastern cities. So all those images are of pigeon coops from um, Egypt, and they're really beautiful and intricate structures um, in many ways. Uh, another employment that could be used, um, uh, those spaces could be used for is as gardens, also reflecting on traditional housing that often incorporates green space. And this can uh, be a way to also allow for vertical farming. So I'm just like, again, trying to speculate on how the growth would happen and what, could be, what it could be employed uh, towards. Uh, so those strategies that like, focus on the architecture, I'm also interested in how we develop the interior. So inter interiority is naturally tactical, and intervening and producing uh, ideas in the interior is a very, um, very interesting way to activate those spaces. And really, that's where living happens. So thinking about the interior of the shelter is of vital importance. Um, so in, in my thinking of how to activate the, the interior, I was literally uh, thinking about how do we cultivate place, how do we seed belonging. And I'm going to segue a little bit here, and I'll, I promise I'm making my way back to that. But uh, by UN code, which maybe you can see it, uh, refugees are prohibited to farm. It's pr they're prohibited to farm because I think, I think, well, I'm going to think, uh, when, with farming com comes sort of an assumption of permanence. Like when you farm a land, there is an assumption of permanence. So there, per the UN, with the agreement, of course, with the host um, um, country, refugees are not allowed to farm or plant. These are unsanctioned growths that you see here. Uh, but like with that in mind, I, I was really interested in how to like sort of bring that farming into sort of the refugee setting. So a project that I was working on on the side as I was working on the refugee studies was like thinking about interior green walls. Uh, I thought about, uh, I worked with this project with a colleague from plant sciences, so he really knew what he was doing. And I just helped design um, the actual wall system. His idea was uh, to employ a genetically engineered plant that are uh, bioluminescence and respond to interior pollutants. So they provided the plants, we designed the wall, and it was a really productive partnership that, a partnership that I pursued. Uh, we also looked at uh, doing sort of a, um, a 3D printed substrate and allowing moss to grow on it. And this was actually a very kind of, this was the moss grown in their lab. So I would 3D print a modular, send it to them. They would soak it in whatever, they would soak it in and soon enough it would host and grow, um, grow moss. Um, the other way we thought about, and I was trying to push for that, is how do we make it portable? How do we almost make a green wall that is like 3D printable, easily, um, easily moved from one location to another, saves water, and you can see where I'm going here. I had a different agenda in mind. How do we make this happen? So we thought about those units that are t entirely 3D printed and almost assembled Lego-like, um, and they use those um, cone-shaped things, which are called containers, where you can actually seed the plant and you could put dirt or any growth medium you find and the plants will grow. That's a section through the 3D modular where it also kind of, we try to utilize the least amount of water and it actually uh, hosted and sustained plants very well, as you can see in the photograph there. So this system, again, I was thinking if we can 3D print it, we can also think about surfaces of living. Like a 3D wall, could, a green wall, sorry, could also start to incorporate things like benches, uh, storage spaces, and a system that would sustain interior living. Uh, so I was working on that, but again, in my thinking, I was like saying, how could this be deployed in an interior shelter? How could it start to host um, activities and become different surfaces? Um, and we, we got it to a point where it's entirely 3D printable. So the idea is like if in a refugee setting, instead of taking the wall, you'll take 3D printer and filament and, we're, and you're able to, to uh, print the wall. And every modular fits on a traditional uh, 3D printer bed. Um, so in addition to that, we tried to grow food and we were successful in growing food. It actually hosted, like we were able to get a decent crop of small potatoes that you can see there. And I mean, I think that like, Thinking about that and the refugees, that kind of strike, um, it was like a, what's the word, home strike? Is that a word? Like, it, yeah, the baseball analogy, you know what I'm going, home run, home run, yeah, home run, thank you. So it, was, it kind of satisfied all the things that I was looking for in terms of portability and allowing the refugees to like sort of like start to like grow their own crops. And here I'm just like experimenting, like how do we deploy it? Um, in the camp, whether it's an exterior, because again, like communal functions, like everybody puts a seat in front of their house to invite people to engage. And that could be a great space to, to invite people to, to come and engage with you. It could become as part of the interior. 
and host becomes a partition and also becomes storage and start to make interior rooms. Uh, in addition to that, seeing it as a food production or uh, like vertical farming kind of medium that would help support the, um, the, and sustain the livelihood of the refugees in the camp. So in addition of thinking about that, I was still interested in, in how do we reuse the interior. So I tried to study the unit. These are the caravan units. You can see the image that are currently deployed in Al-Zatari. And I tried to just study the materials they're composed for and just like track how they might grow and cluster. So bear with me through those next uh, few slides. So uh, obviously uh, it's moved to the side. And then what happens is uh, the refugees start to take parts of those units apart. So I'm thinking, how could we like, use the studs in the wall and recycle them in a way that would can, uh, can support interior growth? And this is just like an illustration of how those clusters may start forming. Um, and then after they grow to a certain part, and they actually do grow to, to that level, those recycled materials could be deployed in sort of this interior living partition that it's, it's still made of found objects and composed of pieces that are recycled from um, the caravan and other sources. But I was thinking that unit could actually start to go into those uh, clustered units or um, cl uh, the expanded shelter units, if you will, um, and start to house living. And house, like, you know, instead of like that image of um, a regular interior, you could start support living and allow uh, it, like a semblance of normalcy to resume at least. Um, so I, we were thinking, um, my research assistant and I, how could we also put usable services like desks and storage within those systems and just like speculating again how this would work in an interior setting. And like think, thinking about like <clears throat> the idea of creating a dining room just out of those um, recycled materials and really start to think about how the unit could transform and become a more, um, more usable and human living space. And just bringing, again, just a series of images that would allow you to see how that would be trans, uh, how it would, you know, create a space of living that would support the refugees. They would have like some agency in designing it. And again, I'm not designing this. I'm just proposing that this could be a scenario that happens. So I would end with the refugee. This, this project, the refugee part, is still ongoing. I'm scheduled to go uh, visit those camps this summer. So I'm hoping a lot of those ideas will become manifest and will become tested um, on actually on the ground and will do some good. That's my hope and aspiration, of course. Uh, but one thing that the study of interiority and displacement taught me is um, th the, th those lessons that I learned from refugee settings had also informed the methodologies I have applied to other research endeavors. Uh, connecting local details and gro global forces under the subtext of contextual dynamism and tactical interior design approaches. This leads me to another theme of my work, which is public interiority as a relational social framework. Um, and um, I was trying to understand how public interiority could start to activate, activate urban um, spaces. So um, in, I'm going to quote a, co a colleague to explain better what public interiority means. So in her paper on the nature of public interiority, Liz Testens indicates that public interiority is situated at the intersection between urbanism, interior architecture, and human perception. The, intersection, the intersectionality enables public interiors to contribute to the construction construction associations and attachments to collectives and settings that provide the substrate in which communities are built both literally and figuratively. Um, so with that, I was like, again, interested in thinking about those public interiors. And um, in, a, in a seminar course that I, um, that I taught, some of the students started to diagram, you know, things like urban corridors that could qualify as public interiors. So this work is by Emily Hodge documenting that. And we don't think of public interiority as like big urban presence in the city, but if you think about it, it's almost the glue that holds places together. And what do I mean by, um, uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll come to that, so just bear with me. So these are other examples of public, of urban interior that also functions um, as a, at a collective civic scale. It also corresponds to the scale of the individual and directs one's engagement and exchanges within the urban setting and its element. So for instance, a medium, for one day could be a shelter, another day could be a site for activism, um, and a, a site of a garden where you could sit and enjoy others. You know, so they have multi-functions that kind of support the communal aspect of any space. 
so this again another student work where um, she where um, Lydia Russell doc investigated um, the uh, trash networks in the city and we, things like again you know we don't think of those as important but those are actually interior systems like interior scaled system to be more accurate that kind of like maintains the function of the city but also reveal a lot about our lives so she actually traced it from three vantage where uh, vantage points of three different users um, another students that um, traced a space of public interiority uh, was Grace Ann Antil uh, Antilburn. Uh, but what she did is she actually highlighted the sexism encountered by female body as she mapped her experience on the night of April 19th in 2021 on and around Market Square in the city of Knoxville, shedding light on the transformation of urban interior parcels into sites of exclusion and hostility. So we like to think of our, those public interiors as positive, productive sites, but they can also transform into hostile sites. And this kind of, this student work kind of ushered me into thinking that um, urban environments have long uh, operated um, through interior cues actually as tools of, of segregation and assimilation at both the individual and the collective scales. So the image on, um, the image on my right um, is a photograph by Elliot Erwitt in 1915 North Carolina. The image reveals the injustice of segregation and the sinister deployment of cues and artifacts, in this case the water fountain and its plumbing appendage, that aim to assert suppression and indignity. In discussing this subject matter in her paper, Bathroom Doors, Drinking Fountains, Jim Crow's um, Racial Symbolic, author Elizabeth Abel points out that the racial difference conveyed in Erwitt's photograph is firmly incorporated within the interior space whose furnishings give body to the social reality disproving the, the fiction of equality. I mean, let's just like dwell on that a bit. Interior cues are kind of, you know, used in a sinister manner to start to segregate and separate people. I mean, to me, like, like, I mean, of course we know that. Of course, the, this picture is not new, but just realizing it and saying it out loud was really, I mean, to me, was really revolutionary and kind of held me accountable to how I think about space and how I go about designing it. The other image is actually in Knoxville, and it is in front of the Tennessee Theater, one of our cherished landmarks, which to my lack of knowledge, I didn't know that until the 1960s, the theater was entirely segregated. And what you're seeing here is three Knoxvillean youths trying to purchase a ticket, being pushed on the sidewalks. They're high schoolers. They were arrested that night. So thinking, I mean, thinking about the atrocity of the event, yes, but also thinking about the medium in which it's occurred. So the idea of the sidewalk being sort of the space in which such acts occurred really kind of start to resonate with me and um, forced me to think about those micro-urban comments or urban comments and how could we rethink, rethink them through design. So just as they are sites of segregation, the micro-urban commons or like public interior spaces also have, used, have been used as spaces of activism. Of course, we, in this picture, we see um, Rosa Park and their, um, her act of um, peaceful resistance launched from the interior space of a Montgomery public bus challenge entrenched racism and helped usher the civil rights movement. So again, like this is, and the other example, sorry, is from the, uh, Nashville streetcar boycott, which is actually a very interesting story that uh, during segregation, um, black Nashvillians were not allowed to ride the streetcar and they started their own company. So the idea of using, you know, empowering um, uh, each, uh, empowering sort of the black Nashville population to really start to start their own company was extremely successful and again proved, uh, proved the power of like things that we normally don't acknowledge like carts, buses, spaces that we don't pay attention to. Uh, so the survey of these events draw my attention to a type of public space that I dubbed uh, microurban commons. So the microurban commons can be characterized as physical spaces of interconnectivity. There are public interior settings that are infrastructural in nature, linking various segments of the city physically through mobile and transitionally, transitionary microspaces, such as bus stops, subways, public elevators and walkway, and also linking those spaces abstractly as shared resources for the common good. Um, again, like I, I was like really was interested in those micro spaces. So not like there's a whole field of public interiority that you can look at and it's super interesting, but I was really focused on those micro urban comments and how they could be utilized. And this is a walk through Knoxville's main um, gay street. Um, so 
I mean, from the, this diagram is just something that, again, I put together. And I think in representationally, that's what I do. So just, I'm just showing you sort of how I think in a way. So uh, from the various campaigns of the 1960s that peacefully protested segregation to the more recent reclaiming of public space by the Occupy Wall Street movement to the use of street closures to provide outdoor space for cultural, religious, or civic gatherings during COVID-19 pandemic, we see the establishment of civic agency through activating public spaces as shared fluid interior, in, interior into, entities. Um, so to go about this research, like, okay, I was interested in that. I had the micro commons. I wanted to see what I could do with that in terms of an interior scale. But I also wanted to like start to like see if, if, if there's any merit to my idea. You know, do really those spaces govern the accessibility of different neighborhoods? And do they, you know, like create invisible boundaries or sometimes visible boundaries, you know, that kind of keep populations separate. Um, so I decided, this is an aerial view of Knoxville, I decided to compare four uh, different districts. Um, the first one here is Sequoia, Sequoia Hill, which is a super affluent neighborhood um, with a very kind of low racial um, diversity. Um, then the right next to it on the river, that's the UT campus, our university's campus, and it, they're both peninsulas. So already their geographic siding is telling you something. You know, they're not placed there haphazardly, right? The idea of using the river as a sort of separating edge factored in both kind of placements. And then uh, the, the one to the side of the UT campus is the downtown area, and the one on top is Mechanicsville, which is an old, um, a working class neighborhood that also ha ha has a high, um, high level of population diversity. So I try to compare, um, to compare and, and study the different uh, fabrics and to map different um, public commons in those spaces and compare them. My TAs and I generated um, sort of this visual atlas of spaces and then every time there's an X in, in the matrix is somewhere we were not allowed to photograph. So again, you see the most Xs appearing in Sequoia Hill, for instance, and you could figure out why. Uh, we also tried to like locate different events and different sightings that happened in the four districts. And I can't, I don't know if I can, you can see my mouse, but let me try. So, okay, you can see that. Uh, so this is uh, Sequoia Hills, and it has the least amount of public services. There is one single bus line that they're ta talking about taking out of the, of the running. Like, so, I mean, you could see again how the other districts are connected versus this. And that is truthfully done by design. So the, the idea is the more public comments correspond to more integration, less public comments is more, like, it remain, keeps the community more exclusive. Um, so with that, I mean, I was just collecting that information and I just thought what, can, what public comments are spaces, micro spaces that start to connect those um, separate entities in the city in an interesting way. So I highlighted three, um, three micro commons that I'm interested in. One was the bus. Uh, the other one was the bus stop, and the other one was the public city elevator. And we have a lot of public parking that is for free in Knoxville, one of the few perks in the city. Uh, so they have a lot of, um, like again, public elevators. So I was interested in those micro spaces and how those three micro commons actually, in, it, it, you occupy them in a very short time frame, but they can deposit the city in a very interesting way. Um, so the bus, for instance, like kind of is an artery that connects different parts of the city together. So the red is the bus lines. Um, and then from the bus, it's not only it's connecting the city. When you're sitting on a bus, there's a different proxemics that connects you to your neighbor sitting next to you. You see the city with the face of someone who, or the back of the head of someone sitting next to you. So it's a really kind of very um, vivid and fluid space to study and understand. Uh, so I was like just generating those animations of what is the experience, the, the idea of the multi vantage point of the bus uh, that the bus gives us. So thinking about, you know, understanding the bus in that kind of sensibility or the interior bus in that kind of sensibility. And uh, we started to think, what if the, the passage of the bus is linked to the visual atlas? And as you're sitting in the bus, you're reading the history of the city. So the incident with the sidewalk in front of the Tennessee theater, I would know about that. I would be aware of that. I'd be cognizant about that as I you know, traverse um, the city. 
so again, we, we started to just, you know, do, do ex and when I say we, it's me and in some incredible research assistants that I, I'm very fortunate to, um, to, to have had work with me. So we started to look at the bus's interior, trying to understand it, and really simple things like equipping it with a QR code that links you uh, to a, a historic registry of some sort, or like adding screens that would tell you about the city. Uh, in terms of the bus stop, things like doubling the canopy, so you add shade. Removing the, the handrails, so if a homeless person wants to lay down, they can lay down. Um, things like adding speakers, adding clearer maps, you know, just be, like really small intervention that would actually make bigger, uh, big impacts. And along that line of like the small intervention, we also thought about bigger interventions. So how could the bus, bus stop be redesigned? be redesigned as a site of respite in the city. So in this uh, proposal, we actually worked with um, a local design firm, DIA, and uh, Knoxville's Happiness Coalition, which is a nonprofit uh, organization in Knoxville. And this is sort of the design that we came up with, is like thinking about reorienting the seating of the bus, creating a canopy within the city, um, and the idea of like sitting facing each other, someone who wants to stand and share something. So really, again, thinking about the pro pro proximics and engagement with those uh, public spaces. So the last of this series is the public elevator, and this is just a small chunk of downtown, but look how many spaces, and think how many cars factor through that, how many people go through those elevators on a daily basis. So the idea if you go into an elevator and see that space, I mean, there's an opportunity there that's being missed. Uh, so with that said, we thought about creating this interior, um, interior um, elevator insert, where it's also based on this monocoque structure, and I'll go into that in a second. But one part was highlighting a local community member, like poet Nikki Giovanni, who's actually an Knoxvillian. And like, instead of like, hearing cheesy elevator music, we'll hear her po poetry. You know, for a splitting second before you go into the city, you're exposed to that kind of um, experience. And if that doesn't happen, then we thought about those interlocking ledges within that insert that would actually start to host and support activities from sitting or a little ledge to tie your shoelace. And I mean, and how, and you'd ask, how does that contribute to better, I mean, it's a better understanding of our narrative, of our humanity, of our need to, to kind of engage and you know, be in that kind of setting. So these are like just a few variation of that kind of slipping um, of that interior insert. And then those are just a few functions of how they could be used as seating, as like even a puzzle to engage kids. So just again, thinking about those micro intervention as a way to establish or start or seed change. I'm gonna say seed because it's the appropriate word to use here. Um, and again, we exhibited this project and I showed this slide because what schools we get, we got to exhibit it in a micro urban comment in common in downtown Knoxville. And this is the space where it got exhibited. And I love that person standing. I mean, I actually homeless people use that space a lot because it's nicely sheltered. So I, I love that, that it's this interior room and we get uh, to display that work there. So here, this is just part of the exhibit. And um, I, I lost track of time. I, I'm like, you can, Two minutes, oh boy. All right, so, I mean, moving on, I'll, I'll try to, like, can I have five, maybe? Okay, all right. So th this idea is like building, again, those lessons learned from those refugee settings. I was, this is an article that I wrote for the Interiors Journal titled The Changing Room. So thinking about how spaces, our interior spaces, can become spaces of multiplicity. So this idea of multiplicity opposes this multi-function moderate idea. So the idea is not that you have an open room that become anything, it could, it's a room that kind of layers its own program. And this is work by Christia Bravo, by the way, and it's part of her thesis project that shows that layering of urban spaces. And I, like, I was again challenging this idea of like, if we live in a single room, how could we start to think about systems that kind of um, create um, interior spaces just by doubling up function. So this illustrator is not my, illustration is not mine. It is by, it's a project called Turn On by the Viennese design firm, Alsward Gut. And it, it, it really pushes the idea of how that interior space could like become, rotate and become different ways of um, utilizing the interior, not based on flexibility. And I want to create that distinction because flexible space is not multi, multiple, multivalent space. It's multi, like it's, it's what we all experienced in the pandemic to put it more accurately, like how your, your kitchen became your office or your living room became a school. So that is the idea of multiplicity that I was trying to explore. 
This is the last part that I will show uh, because it really takes a full um, delve into this idea of um, thinking about screens and public interiority. This is very flavored by the pandemic. This research was done at the height of the pandemic. So it's really thinking about this new space that the pandemic introduced, the space of the screen as sort of this interior space that became our livelihood for a good chunk of time. And I called it screen interiors. And I was like really interested in, in studying this phenomena. And a uh, student also did studies and collages, like thinking about how those screen spaces allowed us to be multi uh, omnipresent in, in, in space, you know, be in different locations in multiple times. I don't know if you guys did this, like have you been on two Zoom meetings all at once pretending that you are, <laughs> everyone is guilty of it. You know, so this idea of omnipresence like came into factor, but I was interested in the idea of the screen being sort of the medium where that could happen. And really starting to study how that changes sort of the parameters of our interior space. So in this collage done by Grace Ann Antelburn, Antelburn for, the, for a class again that I taught, she was tracing the interior apartment with the space of the screen and then how that could even change our body, change our reading of space, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is just an animation um, done by uh, Bryla Houston that also talks about that multiplicity and the way it changes our reading of the body. Uh, I did my own study on that and then devised a script that kind of start to segment the, like this kind of tracked my time on the computer during the pandemic. So I took like backgrounds, my Zoom backgrounds, and it would segment it based on where I clicked as I'm in a Zoom meeting. And this was actually of a Zoom meeting. Actually, it was a final review, I think. That it, so it shows you the longer time, the more uh, broken up the images. And these are just like the tracks of that, that script um, and going from there. I will... Um, stop there. I mean, I'm not going to talk about that, but please allow me to just like end. I'm, I'm going to have to like, sorry, skip through those, but you get to like glimpse through those. I, as I, I was going to go into teaching, but we ran out of that. But this is a good segue into that. I just want to end um, on a slide. Uh, where we go? Perhaps it's best. So a lot of my projects in studio also engage different, um, different topics that build on the same aspects that I showed you. So I try not to separate that, although it's not like maybe not working with refugees, it's also exploring interiors as, um, as different mediums, um, a, a space of multivalent presence. So, I mean, back to the beginning. So I would like to conclude this um, talk from, again, the. Uh, a quote from the essay I wrote titled On the Move uh, that, ap that appeared in Brian Cantley's new book, Speculative Coolness. And I really start to think again that Earth is a moving planet, a turbulent and unstable body made of active flows that cycle and fold into metastable patterns proliferated by technology. So the intrinsically aspect, uh, the intrinsically active aspect of our word, geologically, compositionally, and metaphorically, and now more than ever necessitates, necess necessitates um, metastable, responsive, and relational resolution. So this dynamic becoming bequest equivalent architecture, itinerant, morph morphologically nomadic. So again, I encourage you all to start to think about those more those nomadic spaces, you know, space and architecture does not always have to be stereotomic. You know, it could be like nomadic, it could be movable, it could be responsive. And I think that is sort of in the age of those happenings that we are all encountering. A new era dem demands that multiplicity. And with that, thank you. All right, we have a few minutes here to take a few questions. Who wants to go first? Don't hold back. What's an aspect of your research of the refugee camps that you're looking forward to getting to deploy most when you go there this summer? Uh, honestly, it would probably be the green wall because it's most resolved. And I think like, again, you know, like any intervention, I'm trying to be light, my tendency is to go in and change everything. So I'm trying to employ ways that my intervention would be light handed and it would actually profit uh, the community there. So I think that would be my first um, and already, actually, I'm not going to take credit to that. Already, refugees are using 
um, mattr the mattresses, they get given mattresses, so they're using the filling and plastic cups to grow plants. They invented that system on their own, and it's working in, in amazing ways. You know? So it's just building on things that are already there. It's really beautiful work. Um, you. you alluded to the role of representation right. in your practice and in your research, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about how the sure. making of a drawing or a collage advances your research. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I, I kind of dub my work as it delves into everything, but like I feel that representation is integral to, 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 for me to understand the work, but also to change the reading and the, and the game. Like for instance, in the refugee study, if I didn't employ advanced computing, like I just wanted to kind of resonate. So I think uh, using representation as a way that would harness ideas, but also harness attention to a certain topic is sort of what I'm trying to do here. Um, and I, I mean, I, in terms of method, I don't subscribe to one method. I always try to teach myself new things. So like the, the, the procedural coding program is something that I'm trying to teach myself. And I think this is sort of uh, like a plea to all of you is to keep finding new technologies because I think what you, like what you put forth matters. The image that captures the imagination is a catalyst to seeding change, if you want to think about it in that sense. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. I had a similar question for your graphic style. I really admire it. And like what programs you use to make those and kind of the process in creating them. Uh, so it's a bunch. It's like sometimes the fastest way because of the constraints of time. Uh, I use, I mean, I teach representation to our students, so that's kind of my, I teach it for incoming first year, and we use Rhino heavily and the Adobe Suite, so a lot from talking to students, a lot, yeah, actually, our programs are very similar. We were actually talking about assignments that we both do, like we do a painting analysis, you do a painting, you know, so there's like some things that, uh, so I use that, uh, I use that a lot, but I'm like uh, using more like, again, Grasshopper is something that I use. But also what I'm urging you, um, like the new program that I'm learning is called Houdini FX, which is a free procedural modeling program. But what happens with those program is they start to cannibalize each, each, like themselves. So like now you see a grasshopper designed structure that looks like everything else. So you kind of have to be new in terms of how you invent uh, your mean of design. And I mean, doing, also making by hand. Like I think in Nate's studio, there was like a highlight of my day to see physical models, you know? It was like, it's, there's such a richness to making manually that nothing digitally could compare to. So uh, I'm a little bit of both. I've been slacking on the physical end just because of demands and restrictions, but I, I would say that like a combination of all that. When it comes to your um, green wall idea that's supposed to be utilized for these refugee camps, do you also believe that should it prove to be very successful in these hopeful upcoming years that these um, green walls can be utilized for homeless shelters as well as refugee camps across the world? Because it's often um, found in uh, various cultures that certain palettes or certain religions can um, not necessarily restrict, but it does um, it, it does influence what they do eat. So do you think that should this be a success that people should implement these more in homeless camps and um, other refugee camps around the world? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the genesis of this wall was meant just for any interiors. That's when my, the colleague approached me is the idea of, I mean, it was a sensing, it was a sensing and reporting wall. So it was like that the plant would sense interior pollutants and report by bioluminescing, which is a great idea, you know, but. Like um, it could, so the idea that there's two factors in the, in the green wall, the wall and the plants that go in it. So if you can create a system that kind of allows for the interchangeability of both, I think the applications are, are endless. All right, this isn't a question, but just a comment. And I was just going to thank you for demonstrating how something we talk a lot in terms of interiors about proximity, right? 
and having connections. And so we connect people, we connect people to patterns of living right. and connecting people to place. And I just want to thank you for showing how that can be applied outside of like domestic realms and in the public sphere in really important ways. And so if you think about, many of you took 101 either with me or with Bud and how to really be, make change, a lot of times is about paying attention, which Tina Seelig said. Mm -hmm. And so just your ability to pay attention to those micro urban spaces is really important. Yeah, awesome. So thank you yeah, for that. Thank you, thank you for yeah. acknowledging that. And with that, we would like to conclude this Hyde lecture. Please join me in giving a huge round of applause to Rana Abadeh for a really engaging lecture. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.